Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will talk about Native American art and artists with guests. Lulani Arquette, President and CEO of the Native Arts and Cultures Foundation. John Vanistall, President and CEO of the Idle George uh, Museum in Indianapolis. And Della Warrior, Director of the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture in Santa Fe. So thank you all for joining. I, I am so pleased that we were able to put this together and to talk about cultures that are so important to American history um, that really need to be exposed. And I'd like to start, uh, Lani, with, with you. You have this amazing organization that was uh, originally seeded by uh, the Ford Foundation and then uh, became independent and you've been running it uh, uh, ever since. Uh, could you talk a little bit about your role, the role of the Native Arts and Cultures Foundation to advance knowledge uh, of these cultures and, and the art and artists um, uh, of, of these diverse cultures, and also talk about the importance of our understanding in this country of Native arts and culture? Sure, thank you. And I'd just like to say uh, aloha kakahiaka. Uh, I uh, hail from Native Hawaii, um, Hawaiian, Native Hawaiian from Hawaii, but I'm living now in the Pacific Northwest in Portland, Oregon area. And I'd also like to thank you, Mark and Oppenheim for inviting me to participate in this discussion. And it's great to see Della and uh, John again, uh, two of my esteemed colleagues that I really uh, respect and uh, their leadership. So, uh, NHCF, the Native Arts and Cultures Foundation, was launched about 11 years ago, and we were launched with intent to provide uh, a, uh, a venue and a platform uh, for uh, Native artists and culture bearers, and to provide more support, uh, raise the visibility of, and help uh, build and strengthen the field. So what we've done in the last, we've provided primarily financial support through fellowship programs to individual native artists. And we, help, we have helped them over 504 now, we've helped advance their artistic practice in their careers. We've helped them raise their visibility and access at things like convenings and on panels with partners. And we part partnered with other institutions uh, both of them that are sitting here also, we've done some work together um, and to, to uh, particularly present their work through exhibitions, performances, and uh, to hear their voices. We also, through our fellowship program, we were able to, we, we found how important it was for mentoring in our Native communities. We know the value of mentoring, of passing on that knowledge and that artistic practice in those uh, traditions and values that are so in, so uh, important in our native communities. So we have also a mentorship, a mentor fellowship, where it was a rigorous one-year program where apprentices were allowed, uh, enabled to work with um, with mentor fellows on their chosen practices. And then we, through all of this past years, we've recognized the really profound importance that arts and cultures have in bringing to light social, environmental, and cultural justice for our native peoples. It is that, that native, uh, that creative spirit that is often at the forefront during these movements. Um, and I can, in, in almost every century and every generation. So as we move into our future work, we have uh, just finished a, our 2021 to 2025 strategic plan. This is perfect timing. And we'll be focusing on a uh, new programming called the Shift Transformative Change in Indigenous Arts, which combines all of this work we've been doing in support of individual Native artists, uh, mentoring, and social change work. And this is a, um, a program, actually it was just launched two days ago. And it focuses on efforts that are built upon community cultural assets uh, and resilience and strengths. And it draws increased attention to our native artists, our communities, our perspectives and our challenges. Uh, but particularly through 
raising the visibility of our strength in our communities, the strength of our values and our artistic practices and what we have to contribute and bring to the discussion as part of this nation and uh, including challenges relative to climate change and sacred sites and waters and, um, and uh, food sovereignty and also including uh, how we need to look at our institutions in different ways and maybe reorganize, re-engineer our institutions to be uh, much more um, uh, community involved and community led and artistic led and, and, uh, and involved. So, and we also have an early career support program that we're launching for, um, that provide critical support to newer career artists with careers under 10 years and help them to grow their careers and launch in much greater ways. And then finally, the last thing is, I think you pro folks might have heard, we have, we're, uh, we are, the Center for Native Arts and Culture is launching here in Portland, Oregon. We were uh, just really humbled, blessed to get um, the gift of a building in Portland, Oregon, an urban Portland, Oregon, that will become the new Center for Native Arts and Cultures and it will provide a critically needed environment to catalyze native peoples, artists, and culture bearers to influence positive social, cultural, and environmental change. We will have, it's gonna be a vibing place for presentation, exhibition, and uh, symposiums, and uh, both locally for local artists and nationally. And I'll John, stop there. John, could you, could you uh, take some of the themes that Lulani uh, raised and uh, comment not only on the work um, of uh, your work at the Auto Drug uh, Museum, but also about the sensibility surrounding Native arts and culture, right? There is this sort of colonialist approach, um, uh, a, a paternalistic approach. There is a um, cultural appropriation that, that, that occurs. Yet it is really important that we recognize from the heart of the art that all people need to be engaged with all art and need to be informed by it. So there is this very tricky space to navigate when we're talking about uh, ethnic art and, art and artifacts, whether it's Jewish or, uh, or African-American or Latin Hispanic or Asian, or Native American, how do we present art in a way that is respectful, but that is also contextualized so that every time you see a work of art, you actually can see it from different perspectives and absorb the knowledge and the wisdom that it, that it imparts? Well, I think the most important way to move away from um, the way it's been done in the past is through engagement with the people themselves. And we um, work with living artists and um, we have a national council of native peoples that advise us. Um, but I think engaging the communities is really the most important part of the work we do. And um, another key part of the Idle George presentation is contemporary native art. Uh, art that may be painting or sculpture or mixed media or digital media today that is um, wonderfully contemporary, wonderfully evocative, and a part of mainstream American art. Um, and I think um, we've done that primarily through the Idle Drawer Contemporary Art Fellowship that began 20 years ago. And through that, we recognize five artists every biennium um, award um, $25,000 fellowship, uh, produce a catalog of their work, introduce them to the public, um, exhibit their work, and then um, promote them, not only among other Native American museums, but the general museums as well. So I think more than anything else, it's that sense of inclusivity that um, Native artists are at the table. We're providing a platform for them to share their art and share their ideas. Um, we also do that through uh, artists in residence program we have. About four artists are invited to come and work in residence in the museum every year. 
And then we have an Indian market that brings uh, customary, more traditional artists as well as contemporary artists to sell their works to the public. One of the things that, that I think is, is really interesting is the fact that uh, a lot of Native arts bridge um, what is typically shown in museums and the hierarchy of art in fine arts museums breaks down when it comes to Native arts, um, where you have decorative arts in fine arts museums are frequently marginalized or not as respected as paintings and so on, whereas it seems that in, in Native arts, this sort of confluence of storytelling, um, decoration, uh, tradition, um, the, the, the various visual aspects, Stella, um, it's, a, it's a different experience, at least it is to my eyes, going from museum to museum. It's a very rich experience. Um, how do you present the connections between the various aspects of culture that are, uh, that at least to me, seem to be such a holistic experience as opposed to something where you hang a painting on the wall and just sort of look at it? How do you present that, that richness in your museum? Well, art is all you know about the people that create it from their culture, their history, that goes into uh, making that piece of art. So in our museum, we engage with the communities. Uh, if we're doing an exhibition, we work with uh, community curators and include their stories about the art uh, because it's, it's really fascinating to hear, hear these stories from a native perspective. It's more about the whole history of that piece rather than just looking at it as an object of beauty uh, or an object to be studied. But we, we, you know, we really focus on getting um, people from the community to talk about the, uh, to help with the actually curating the exhibit. And then throughout all of our exhibits, we have year long programming whereby we include artists from those communities to do demonstrations, to come in and say, do a pottery demonstration or do murals or to talk about art and uh, art issues. So that is you know, just a standard practice that the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture has been doing for a number of years is working with native communities to make sure that their stories are woven into the exhibition rather than just coming in and looking at beautiful pieces of art and not connecting them with the people who made it, why they made it, how they made it, and all those things that you know go into it, including the ceremonies and sometimes the songs, I mean the songs and certainly prayers go into art. And it's you know it's all very spiritual because native people are spiritually uh, based. You know, you're, you're making such a good point because uh, very often you see in contemporary environments the work, the finished work, uh, whereas in my experience that there's a, there's a greater emphasis on the technique that, that is on display, the storytelling that is on display, the cultural rituals that connect to the creation process. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it, it, it's really deeply affecting and it's a completely different experience for me coming in without that background. Um, there's also the, the other very interesting element in that Native communities are so incredibly diverse and, and the, the attached cultures are, are, are so amazing. Milani, you know, one of the things that, that I experienced when we did the search that resulted in your selection was that we had representatives from so many different tribes and there were so many different starting positions. Um, how do you, bring people together um, across these, these different sensibilities um, so that the community can actually function as a self-strengthening community, but also with respect to individual cultures and not try to genericize, you know, between, uh, you know, uh, Della's uh, sensibility, uh, a Native Hawaiian sensibility, uh, Native Alaskans sensibility and the various tribes in Alaska. How do you, how do you manage that? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a great question, John, and that's something that uh, I think all of us 
uh, have worked on over the years. And, and, and as a national organization, you're exactly right. And with 574 recognized, federally recognized tribes and Alaska Native corporations and over 500,000 Native Hawaiians across the United States, you're absolutely right. It's and each with your, our own unique uh, voices and cultural practices and, uh, and, and whatnot. So uh, one of the, we've, um, you know, we've, we're in our grant making, we've, one of uh, our real intentionalities around our grant making, and especially with our grant review panels, is to make sure there's a, we look really across the broad swath of the geography. We're very attentive to the geography when we're, when we're um, um, reviewing and awarding our grants to make sure that it's inclusive across all re regions as much as possible, and including the outreach that we do and the site visits that we did pre-COVID, it was, it was built into the work that we do. But also this uh, bringing together, one of the things that we've done is convened, had convenings. We're big champions of convenings and bringing um, uh, both in uh, bringing artists together from Hawaii, Alaska and the continental native tribes in these convenings so that they can share their work um, and that we then have a public facing. We did two convenings in 2017 and 18, and it's some of our future work is very heavy, uh, gonna be involved in national convenings of the field. And um, we find that when you bring people together, now this uh, virtual formats are what we're doing now. So there will be probably an element of virtual formats along with in-person once we get past COVID. But I think the virtual will always also be part of the platform. But um, we're finding that when we bring people together that uh, it gives them an opportunity to really engage and learn with one another, whether they be an artist, an administrator, a non-native, because we always do public facing work with other partner institutions, that that has helped um, create a sense of connectivity and understanding about um, our common humanity. And, and then there are the great then, excuse, sorry for interrupting, there are also the great collections. If, if, if you look at the great collections uh, beyond um, uh, the Idle Jorg um, and, and uh, your museum uh, over in Santa Fe, uh, Della, Della, what, what other great collections are there that people can access? We just did a poll. We found that 70% uh, of people had um, viewed uh, native collections um, in, in the recent past. Uh, there were, and then it kind of fell off uh, pretty quickly. Um, what are the great collections that you admire, that you feel uh, are must see if you're, if you're interested so that you can engage in, these, in this incredible richness um, in, in North America, Della? Well, John, John talked about, you know, that their museum focuses on contemporary. We also have a, a one contemporary gallery and we'll open another one next year. We just received a, a great uh, gift from, a, from a, a couple here in Santa Fe, longtime supporters. And so we'll be opening another gallery, but you know, art is always changing and it's dynamic and it's forward. So one of the new uh, forms of art, native art to be collected, I think is, is glass sculpture. We are opening a, an exhibit on hopefully, you know, God willing with this pandemic, we can open on April 18th. We will have 32 native sculptures from uh, glass artists from all across the country, including indigenous people from uh, artists from um, uh, Australia and New Zealand. So we'll have, I think 132 pieces and it's so fascinating how these artists, and I think there we probably have 40 different tribal representations, but they have taken their traditional designs from their respective cultures and incorporated them into these beautiful pieces of glass. And it's gonna be a really fascinating exhibit. Uh, and I think it's the first of its kind. There's a book out that we just, uh, Letitia Chambers, Dr. Chambers is the curator, and it's a, a beautiful book that shows these artists work and tells their stories. So, you know, art is always uh, different 
and it's it's a way I think of educating the public that Native people are changing too. We're not static, and we're not the people that they see on TV. And but you know we are in the 21st century, and the art is is uh, different now that than it was 200 years ago or 300 years ago. However, it still contains, you know, those uh, spiritual aspects from and cultural from those communities. And John, what what other museums do you think have great collections? I mean, I'm looking here. I was just I was just sort of jotting down. You know, um, Rochester, the uh, Rochester Museum and Science Center has a fantastic uh, collection that still needs to be uh, exposed more. You have the Royal Ontario Museum um, and, and on the uh, uh, West Coast, you have the Audin uh, Museum, there's Numai, there's the Heard Museum in, and the Gilcrease over in Arizona. What other uh, museums do you admire for their collections and their presentation of art? Well, you just covered a lot of bases with the ones you mentioned. Obviously, the National Museum of the American Indian in Washington has an extraordinarily important and large collection. Um, the Royal BC Museum in Vancouver uh, is one of my favorite places to visit always. Um, and the Autry Museum in Los Angeles. Oh, yes. Combined with the Southwest Museum. And uh, they have an extraordinarily important collection. And I'm very impressed with what they're doing with it as well. So um, there are both Native American focused museums and mainstream museums that are doing good things to uh, elevate Native American art. Do you do you find that that storytelling uh, takes an elevated? I mean, my my own first uh, exposure to Native arts and culture was really in the in the spoken word. There were oral uh, traditions that were handed down, and I I used to listen to recordings because I love. The, the stories of different cultures. Um, do you find that in your uh, presentation of art, that storytelling takes a more prominent role? And how does that jive with sort of the traditionalist museum education or museology that, that we all learn, John, um, you know, when, when we're studying this field? Well, I think museums in general have moved forward and some more so than others, but we've, um, long adopted the sense that the, the words, whether they're written or spoken, need to be from Native people and not about them. So we've um, done that with label panels, but also with audio and video recordings. And I think one of the wonderful things about working with artists of today, the contemporary artists, is we're able to document them be a video and for example our contemporary art fellows have all been uh, recorded in broadcast quality video and we've been doing that for two decades and the database of information and stories background on the art that we collect physically that comes out in those videos is powerful and i, I think um, one of the things we need to do is make those videos accessible to the public in a searchable database format, and that's something we're working on now. I have a number of questions here that I want to I want to put with put you. First of all, uh, one of one of the attendees said, uh, "Let's not forget the Hood Museum, which we certainly we certainly don't uh, don't uh, don't want to do." Um, in terms of of uh, the redefinition of of our past history and our discovery of past history of which. Uh, many of us are not aware. Um, how do you think these museums need to function and your communities of, of artists, uh, people who advance the art must function in order to modernize um, Americans' understanding of this country's past um, and contextualize it? Uh, Della, do you, wanna, do you wanna take a shot at that? Um, we, you know, with our educational programming that accompanies our exhibits, we've had a, you know, we have panelists uh, present uh, periodically on a number of issues that are current among Native people. 
be it in, you know, related to health or, uh, I mean, we did a sovereignty food symposium uh, two or three years ago because people, all they know, most, the majority of people, they just know a lot of the negative statistics about Native people. So we felt it was important to let the public know that, you know, Native people now are exerting their sovereignty more and more and they're addressing their own problems. And there's some ma amazing uh, things that are happening in native communities. They're developing their own schools. They've, you know, taken over the management or building new hospitals. You know, they're operating uh, very efficiently. So for the average person, all you, you see are negative statistics. So we feel it's really important to educate people about the natives of today and then have them tell about their projects. But at the same time, they're able to bring in, you know, the history of their respective uh, Pueblos or tribes. Now, the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture, our focus is on the uh, tribes and Pueblos of the greater Southwest, because, you know, we have limited space and limited, uh, <laughs> dollars for staff, so we can't have a lot of experts on all these uh, 574 different tribes and and then in Alaska Native people. So we have to focus, you know, only on the primarily on the south southwest. So I think that's one one way, you know, we uh, inform the public, but we also uh, have artists coming in talking about, you know, their work, and most of them can can trace where they learn this form of art generations. And so they bring in the stories of their great, great grandparents that made pottery. Uh, and then they talk about how it's been handed down to them and the terms around why they made that, you know, pottery. And uh, we also have an ongoing pottery demonstration program for these people from the communities to talk about their work and their art and their, their culture. The wonderful thing about this sector is that people share knowledge. So between uh, Nancy Rossoff, Liz Glassman, Mary Kershaw, uh, Joanne Bowser, we, we've received uh, uh, people appointed to the Denver Art Museum, the Field Museum, the American Museum of Natural History, uh, the Museum of Northern Arizona and Flagstaff, um, uh, so many others, um, uh, the Nelson Atkins Museum. <laughs> it's, it's, it's wonderful to, to when you look at this picture uh, and you start to connect the dots, Lilani, right? There are a lot of dots to connect, aren't there? Absolutely a lot of dots to connect. And I, I think one of the things I wanted to share with you folks is that about a year ago this time, We'd, we had been working with the NEA and some of the federal agencies to uh, co-host a convening in DC for Native Arts and Cultures for about five years. And it finally came to fruition uh, in 2019. Uh, we, uh, we were able to cram it at the end of the year, plan it with an advisory council. And it happened in February, right before the COVID. So we were able to meet in person in DC and it was co-hosted by NEA, NEH, and about four other federal agencies that do a lot of work with tribal communities, particularly in the creative industries, but, but beyond also, like Anna, for example. And the, we uh, planned with the advisory council a, a day-long session, a day and a half. We had a, a reception at NMAI the night before, and then the, the next day was a full day's of session with a series of panels that, uh, that featured Native American artists, administrators, leaders to talk about the work that they're doing in community and the issues we, uh, they'd like to see uh, relative to uh, federal agencies. So we had about 250 people there. So that was kind of a beginning, a start. We're producing a report from that that we're gonna be launching on March 30th. I'll make sure you have that link, all of you and uh, in, in affiliation with um, grant makers in the arts, NACF and NEA are co-hosting that webinar to launch the recommendations that came from that report. So we're really excited about that because that's a lot of 
not everybody could attend that. We had limited funding and, and, and limited uh, planning time, but to make it more available to and for discussion and access, this webinar will launch the report and then we're gonna have group uh, study groups after that to help implement some of the recommendations. And one of those, Della and John, has to do with museums. There were some museums uh, and, and what, uh, what some of the other museums are doing, some recommendations around museums. So. Wonderful, wonderful. We're coming to the end of our time. Um, John, um, I, I'd like you to just sort of outline um, the agenda for, for the Idle George George, for the next uh, months and, and the next years, uh, what you have on tap. And then Della, we're gonna give you the last word. Uh, John? Okay. Well, I, there are a lot of things I could talk about, but I wanna mention one thing that we're very excited about. The, the museum's presentation of native art and culture has been very broad and very encyclopedic, and we will continue to be about all of North America's uh, communities. However, we've made a real commitment to focus our attention and energy on the Great Lakes cultures. This is where we live. Uh, we occupy the land of the Miami and the Potawatomi and others. And that has not been one of our strongest points here at the Idle Jord. But over the next 10 years, you're gonna see an extraordinary change and that will be um, a much bigger focus. And we've been collecting, we've been exhibiting, we've been engaging the communities of the Great Lakes region. So stay tuned for that. It's part of the history. I think that's so important. Our history did not start with Europeans coming to the shore. And the fact that, that um, I am a white person who is living in a place means that I also need to know about that place, its history, and I need to make a contribution by at least being myself informed to pre preservation of those memories and listening to people who have those those that knowledge to to transfer transfer it's it's only a matter of respect right if we're going to be americans then we have to know about america right Della? yes and i i have to say this with um uh, respect you know i loved uh, the inauguration yesterday but i and that why well, i didn't get to watch the whole thing so maybe they did include some indigenous people but it would have been appropriate at some point during the day to acknowledge whose land this was and we welcome, you know, everybody's Americans now, but they should always acknowledge that this land belonged to the Native Americans. And also they could have had a Native person pre, uh, do a prayer, incorporate them. They had other, nat other minority cultures in there, but Native people were left out again, and that's why we are so invisible because we're such a small minority. Anyway, that's just Della Warrior, you know, talking. Being but a back warrior. to what is, our, huh? Being a warrior. Oh, well, what we have uh, coming up, I uh, already mentioned the glass exhibit, but we, uh, we've had our one of our permanent exhibits, the Here Now and Always exhibition that was put up in uh, 1997 we have been uh, in doing planning and fundraising. So construction um, will start next month and that exhibit will open uh, in the spring of 22. And also I mentioned the contemporary gallery, the new one, actually that is funded by Drs. Joanne and Bob Balzer. They made a very generous gift towards uh, the new, uh, this new gallery, and it has a long name, so I hope I get it right. Um, Joanne and Bob Balzer, contemporary, no, I'm sorry, uh, gallery of uh, native market and contemporary art. So that should be really exciting because it's going to feature the very uh, best of native art from these various uh, art markets, kind of the, the winners of, of the you know, these various awards and in, in, in the different mediums that uh, will open also in uh, 22. And coming this year, we have our annual Native Treasures Art Market, which is uh, during the uh, Memorial Day weekend. Uh, this year, it's going to be virtual again, unless there's some 
the vaccines get distributed quicker than we think they will be. It'll be it'll be virtual, and we'll have hundred about 150 artists on that. And this event supports the artists as well as uh, Mayak. And we also on our on our website. Let me give you this. It's IndianArtsAndCulture.org, and we have a uh, lots and lots of videos by Native uh, artists from different mediums that you can people could watch and learn if they're interested. But there's some fabulous uh, profiles of artists on there as well. Uh, so I invite the, everyone to go to our website and look at all of our videos and the um, YouTube and all the things that were happening at, at MIAC. And thank you very much for making me a part of this. It's good to see John and Lulani. And uh, I wanna share this. I was one of the lead consultants on, on uh, the Native American Arts and Culture to help create that with the Ford Foundation funds and also raising money to match that. So I'm really thrilled that it has uh, not only made it, it's survived and they're doing a great job, Lilani. So go, just keep, yes. keep up the good work. Thank so our last, our last two polls um, are, are really uh, interesting. 75% of the people who have responded have said that they were uh, most exposed to Native American art through museums. Um, and um, uh, uh, the last poll, um, is is really about um, how important people feel that Native American uh, art is. 88% felt it, was, it, it is very important to their lives and their sensibilities. Look, we have an opportunity to create the country that we want to have. The, the idea of different sensibilities and dialogue with each other, not necessarily conceding, but in vigorous debate um, and debate that is uh, that unfolds in a uh, cordial, um, and determined way, that's, that creates our country. And this is, uh, I'm so thankful to, to be able to sit here and learn from you and to participate with you in this dialogue. Let's keep the, the dialogue going. Thank you all participants for coming. Stay safe and, and thank you uh, guests for, for helping to enlighten us. <laughs>